This is Whole Backstage Live, and you're listening to our 13 Days of Halloween. Taken from Catherine Tucker Wyndham's 13 Alabama Ghosts and Jeffrey. This first compilation of Alabama ghost stories brings you famous ghosts and locations from throughout the mid to late 1800s. Shadows of the unrest which plagued the South during the Civil War. You can still visit some of these locations even to this day. Others have long since been reclaimed by the earth and trees and creeping vines. Thirteen individual readers will share with you these stories of love lost, unbearable tragedy, unsettled ghostly apparitions, and untimely death. Look for a new episode daily until October 31st. A lively fiddle and dancing feet can be heard when passing the Harrison Cemetery in The Dancing Ghost of Granser Harrison. The trip into Kinston had taken longer than the Coffee County farmer had planned. And he knew that no matter how fast the mules trotted, it would be after dark before he and his family reached home. However, he reassured his wife there would be a moon to light the road home, and the children could sleep on the pile of quilts in the wagon. When his business was finished, he got the children settled in the back of the wagon, helped his wife up on the seat beside him, untied the mules from the hitching post, and headed for home. As they rode along, the family finished eating the boiled peanuts they had bought in town. The children were quiet, but their father could hear them crunching on jawbreakers. He hoped they would fall asleep soon. He did not want them to be awake when the wagon neared the Harrison Cemetery. Skittish mules, a frightened wife, and terrified children would be more than one nervous man could handle if the old Grancer Harrison's ghost chose to put on a performance. He slowed the mules a bit to give the children more time to drift into slumber. And he tried to carry on a casual conversation with his wife. He knew what she was thinking. They had both heard stories that very afternoon of the dancing ghost of Grancer Harrison, and they dreaded passing his burial place. By the time they had crossed the wooden bridge over Cripple Creek and had started up the hill on the other side, the children were asleep. The farmer slapped the reins against the mule's broad backs and urged them into a trot. He wanted to get past the cemetery in a hurry. The wagon had just reached the top of the hill beyond the creek and had come to a broad plateau when there began drifting toward the travelers the faint music of a fiddle playing Devil's Dream and the sound of dancing feet tapping out a rhythm to a lively tune. The mules bolted. The woman clutched her husband's arm in panic, and from the back of the jolting wagon came sleeping voices asking, what, what is it? Where's the dance? It was only after they had reached the safety of their own yard did the man turn to his wife and whispered, Did you hear it too? Did you hear someone calling, Salute your partner? She nodded. Yes, I heard it all. The music, the dancing feet, the caller, all of it. It was old Grancer Harrison himself. This family was not the first, nor was it the last, to report an encounter with the lively ghost of Grancer Harrison, the greatest dancer of them all. Just as Grancer's zest for living became a legend in the southeast Alabama during his lifetime, 
so his ghost has become the area's most celebrated revenant. <sighs> Although the stories about Grancer are numerous, the facts about his life are sketchy. It is known that he moved to Coffee County from Virginia in the 1830s or 1840s, bringing with him his family and his slaves. He homesteaded on land bordering the Pea River, the same river that in 1929 flooded and washed from the courthouse in Elba the records which would have substantiated the stories of Grancer's vast land holdings. On this land, he homesteaded at the edge of a high plateau overlooking the river, he built his home. Some people say Grancer Harrison built a mansion, a traditional style southern plantation house with wide porches, tall white columns, and tree-lined approaches. Others among his descendants say, despite his wealth, Grancer never built a fine house, but lived in a simple one-story log house that had a wide dog trot down the middle with rooms on each side. Whatever the architectural style of his dwelling, it is agreed that Grancer Harrison's home was the social center of what is now Coffee, Geneva, and Covington counties. His barbecues, with whole sides of beef roasting over beds of hot coals, his horse races, he reportedly brought with him from Virginia some mighty valuable horse flesh, <laughs> and his dances attracted scores of guests to his home, and the amical Grancer reveled in his role of host. Perhaps to help offset reports that he cared only for entertainment and good times, Grancer excelled in farming. The yields of his long staple cotton were unmatched on any neighboring plantation, and growers came from miles around to get seed of corn from him, hoping to duplicate his tall stalks, thick with full ears, which flourished in his bottomlands. But though he took pride in his farming accomplishments, and though he delighted in racing his fine horses, and though nobody could match his appetite for barbecue, <laughs> dancing is what he most enjoyed. Almost every weekend, he issued blanket invitations to his neighbors to come and dance to the music of his plantation band. If his friends did not know how to dance, Grancer taught them. After a while, the number of guests at his dances grew so large, his home could not accommodate them all. So then, Grancer supervised the building of a large dance hall right in his yard. It was an immense structure, big enough for a hundred or more dancers. At one end was a raised platform for the musicians and all around the walls were benches for the spectators or for couples who wanted to sit and talk a while. The floors were of hardwood, kept waxed and polished to a slick gloss by a team of servants whose sole duty was to care for the dance hall. On weekends, the place was filled with dancers. Often during the week when there were no guests, Grancer would go to the dance hall with the fiddler from his band and would spend hours practicing the buck dancing and other intricate steps which so delighted the gallery of weekend spectators. He had special dancing shoes made for himself and his tailor fashioned for him a handsome suit, somewhere between Sunday best and strictly formal wear. Folks watching Grancer's flying feet used to laugh and say, he sure stirs up a dust when he dances. Yes, sir, that Grancer purely dances up a whirlwind. <laughs> oh, the passing years did not decrease Grancer's love for dancing. But at last he realized that his frolicking days would end soon. He began to talk of death not in a morbid way, 
but with the practical approach of a businessman preparing for the inevitable. I want to be buried right here, he told his family, pointing to a spot only a few yards from his dance hall. I want to be where I can hear those fiddles and feel the rhythm of the dancing feet. Having selected his final resting place, Grantzer began to make other preparations. He sent his servants to Milton, Florida to bring back a load of brick from the kiln there. And upon their return, he set his skilled brick masons to constructing his tomb. This tomb, all above ground, was unusually wide so that it could hold the feather bed on which Grantzer wished to be buried. The top of his tomb remained open, awaiting his death, and a wooden pavilion was built over the burial plot to protect it from the weather. His instructions were explicit. When I die, he said, I want to be dressed in my dancing clothes with my dancing shoes on my feet. Then I want to be placed on my feather bed and carried to my tomb. After I've been laid in it, resting peacefully on my soft bed, I want my workmen to take the brick we saved for the purpose, they know where the bricks are stored, and seal the top. And the dancing must go on in my dance hall. These instructions were carried out faithfully when he died, and for a while the dances continued. But somehow the gatherings were not much fun without Grants were there to call the figures and to teach new dances and to stir up the dust with his fancy dance steps. Gradually, folks quit coming, and the hall was seldom used. It was soon after his friends stopped congregating in the dance hall that people going down the road near Grantzer's tomb reported hearing a rollicking fiddle and dancing feet. These first stories brought scoffs and disbelief from listeners. But more and more people told of hearing old fiddle tunes and rhythmic tapping of shoes coming from the Harrison Burying Ground, particularly on Saturday nights. Frequently, the mules and horses shied and bolted as they approached the place, and their drivers were certain that the animals, too, heard the sounds of the ghostly dance. And those who heard it declared there was no doubt that the ghost of Grants or Harrison was dancing again, stirring up a dust to the lively tunes he loved. In recent years, John A. Burgess of The Op News has collected stories about Grants or Harrison and has compiled much information about this colorful Coffee County citizen. Burgess often goes to the Harrison Cemetery near Kinston to visit Grantzer's grave and to look out from the high plateau across the river valley and the gently rolling hills. Strolling along the plateau, he tries to imagine where the Harrison home stood and what it looked like. And sometimes he tries to recreate in imagination the gay dances in Grantzer's Hall. Burgess says he is not a real believer in the supernatural, but this is what happened to him. One day, he was out with his dogs in the vicinity of the Harrison Cemetery. It was a bright, sunny afternoon, still and cloudless. Burgess walked up the rise toward the cemetery and paused at the top to look out across the countryside and to wonder how many times Grantzer must have delighted in the same magnificent view. Thinking of Grantzer, he turned toward the brick tomb. At that very instant, the sun disappeared behind a black cloud and, and a cold gust of wind swept past Burgess and in the cemetery, a swirl of dust danced from Grantzer's 
sheltered tomb. This episode was voiced by Jane Cole and concludes our 13 Days of Halloween. If you've enjoyed the series, please rate us and leave a review. Stay tuned and keep coming back for more Hold Backstage Live. This has been a production of the Whole Backstage Inc. and Whole Backstage Live on WBSL Radio. Please, please, please take the time to visit our website and check the show description for a link to all of our social media. Follow us for upcoming events and announcements about what you can look forward to on our production calendar. Contact this show at wholebackstagelive at gmail.com for sponsorship opportunities. Imagine your name reaching all of our listeners through our episodes. I know, crazy, right? Thank you for listening, keep coming back, and stay kind.